Well, howdy there, Mayor. I already see you're hitting the water hole there. Good for you. That's a mighty fine art you got there looking, overlooking your city. What you think we decorate that thing for Christmas? We can put like a big old mega tree right here. Maybe some candy canes over in this area of the park. And some pretty lights on that arch. Oh, wee! Fish tail. And welcome back to Lights by the Sea. This is part two of our prop build for the arches. If you missed part one, I'll be sure to link it in the upper right here. In order for us to sequence the arches, we'll need to build a controller, which will be able to send data from the controller to the arches to power the lights. Today, we'll gather the parts and build the electrical panel that will eventually control the arches. Before we begin, let's talk a little bit about light show layout options. We also reviewed planning for a show in a previous episode. Again, I'll link it up here in the right hand corner. I've decided to use a distributed layout, meaning that I'll put a Falcon 48, which will be my main control in the garage, and it will be connecting to multiple receivers located around the house or in the yard. I've seen many popular builds that use a F16 V3, which does, does have distributed capability, but it is better suited for a dense location where a lot of pixels will be close together, such as a matrix or a megatree. Here's my layout. You can see the main controller over by the garage. We'll have three additional controllers, the house controller, mega tree controller, and arch controller. The arch controller will control the arches and the island outline lights. All right, we now have an idea where the arch controller fits into our plan. So let's get started. The arch controller will basically house three devices, a 12 volt power supply for the lights, a receiver board, and a distribution board. And this will be used for power injection. Here's a list of parts we'll use to build the controller box. I'll also include them in the description below. We'll also need a few tools to build the box. I'll list them over here and in the description below. The step drill bit is a very important tool for today's build. You can pick one up pretty cheaply, less than 10 bucks at Harbor Freight. All right, let's get started. Here are all the parts we'll need for our build. I'll put a link to the parts list in the description below. When building a controller, I like to dry lay out the components and make sure there will be clearance for wiring and box pass-throughs. The power supply will only fit vertically, so we'll put it on the right and the boards on the left. This layout will allow us to easily fit all the cables out of the bottom of the box. We'll arrange the power supply so the power enters from the top and we'll put our box switch on the upper right side of the box. Although we are only going to use three of the data ports of the receiver and five of the power injection ports, we will go ahead and drill all the holes our con controller can support. This will set us up for future expansion. I created a drill template based on the spacing out of the wire glands. We will be using four PG7 wire glands and eight PG9 glands. When drilling plastic, it is best to put some masking or painter tape to prevent the box from cracking or splintering. With the bottom of the box taped, we can now apply the template and drill out our pilot holes. We'll start by drilling the holes for the PG9 glands. It's a good idea to mark your step bit based on the size of the gland. This will prevent us from making the holes too big. Slowly drill the holes with your step bit so you don't overshoot the hole size. Once the hole is drilled, test fit your gland to confirm the hole size. Complete drilling your PG9 holes, then repeat the process for the PG7 holes. Remove your tape and install the glands into the holes. Remove the gland nut, insert the gland, and attach the gland nut on the inside of the box. Now let's measure and mark the location where we'll be installing our power switch. I also printed a template for the power switch from an AutoCAD file. You can get a free student evaluation copy of AutoCAD to do this. Similar to the gland holes, put some tape in the location we will drill out the cutout for the switch and for the Ethernet gland. Again, we'll drill our pilot holes for the power switch. For the power switch cutout, we will put pilot holes at the corners so that we can easily cut out the rectangle. A Dremel is a good tool to make the switch cutout. I have a Dremel here, but want to show you how to do this cut in case you may not have a Dremel tool. Using a carpenter knife, mark an X from the pilot holes at each corner. Then at the center of the X, drill a pilot hole. Next, use the step bit to make a hole big enough to insert a jigsaw. Use the jigsaw to cut out from the center to each of the corners. Next, use a carpenter knife to cut out the triangles. This may take a little bit of effort and time. Do it slowly and safely. Now use a deburr tool to deburr the edges or use a file to file down the edges. Let's dry fit our switch to make sure it fits snugly into our cutout. 
At this point, the box is prepped and we can start mounting the components onto the backing board. I've decided to use the Bud Industries backing board. However, you can use any cheap plastic cutting board from Walmart, a piece of plexiglass that you pick up from Home Depot, or just buy one from a DIY store. I've already attached the power supply to the board using some number six by half inch screws. Well, we'll use these standoffs to secure the distro and the receiver board to the backing board. I picked up this kit on Amazon and we'll include a link in the description below. With the components now on the board, we're ready to start wiring. Although the power supply is protected on the load side, I still like to include fuses to protect the components. We'll use these 30 amp inline fuses. Attach fork crimp connectors to the ends of your fuse wiring. Now attach the fork connector to your power supply. Estimate the remaining length of the wiring you'll need to reach the distro board and then strip, crimp, and connect another fork connector to the fuse wiring. Attach the fork connector to the V-plus on the distro board. Repeat the process for the fuse wiring that will be going to the receiver board. First, dry fit the wire, strip it, and crimp on the connectors. For the receiver end, which fits into a Phoenix connector, we'll put on one of these pin connectors. For the negative connections, we will route the wire under the backing board to keep a clean look. I'll need to drill out holes in the backing board. Also, the 10 gauge wire is a little stiff, so use a pair of needle nose pliers to bend the wire once it's in position. Next, we will need to wire up the switch. Here is a nice wiring diagram I found on Instructables. I'll link it in the description below. We'll need to create two jumpers from the line side to the load side on the switch. Cut a black and a red wire to fit for your jumpers and attach a female spade terminal to both ends. Attach the black wire to the inner connectors and the red wire to the outer connectors. Now we are ready to install the switch into the box. Install the switch into the box and make sure that it fits snugly. Next, insert the backing board with the power supply and the components. Measure your wiring so that it reaches from the power supply to your switch. Wire up the red wire to the L, the line or hot side, the black wire to the N, the neutral side, and the green wire to ground. On the switch side, connect the black, the red, and the green wire to the switch. The Ethernet gland can now be installed into the box and connected to the receiver board. The Ethernet gland comes with a male gland, which we will later install onto a new Ethernet cable. This type of gland requires you to crimp an Ethernet connector after putting the gland on the cable. Let's work on the data cables next. Remove the gland nut and pass the data cables through each of the gland ports. I'm using pre-made Ray Wu wiring. The wiring diagram is brown for V plus or voltage, green yellow is data, and blue is the V minus or ground. Attach your wires to the Phoenix connectors for the board being sure to double check your wiring diagram. For the power cables used for power injection, we will need to build these cables. I have decided to use the weather pack connectors popular in the marine and auto hobby. This MUI kit comes with male and female pin connectors and rubber grommets. We'll be working on the power side, so we'll use the female connectors. Strip back the wire about a quarter inch, then attach the rubber grommet to the wire. Next, set the wire in the female connector. It's very important to get the right tool for crimping these connectors. A regular crimper and some needle nose may work, but it will not be a long lasting connection. Put the front half of the connector into the crimper slot labeled number four. This is the 14 to 16 gauge crimper and crimp the wire to the connector. Next, put the grommet into the crimper slot number five and crimp the connector to the grommet. Now, insert the female connectors into the female weather pack housing. You will hear the connectors click into place. Close the connector on the wires. Here is the completed cable. Now, you need to make up the rest of the power cables. On the other side of our power cables, install pin connectors that will attach to the Phoenix connectors on the distro board.
Your power cables can now be routed through the enclosure glands into the box. We'll be sticking with the standard DC wiring layout and connecting red to V plus and black to V negative. Attach the Phoenix connectors to each of the power cords and then attach them to the distro board. The final step here will be for us to clean up the box and make it neat and organized with some wire ties. Basically, do some cable management. With the power of video editing, the box is cleaned up and ready for a power test. Our power up test will test that the distro board and receiver board are putting out 12 volts DC with the correct polarity. Using our multimeter on the DC setting, we will check each one of our data and power cables for voltage. We should see about 12 volts on each connection. The tests were good, and the final step will be to label our connections. Labeling will help when setting up and taking down the show in the future. Here's the box with all the wires labeled. And here's a final look at the box. The arch enclosure build is now complete. That Bud Box 32016 is really nice for an enclosure for a receiver box. If you don't get a slim power supply like I did, you can get one of those Meanwell power supplies and turn it on its side. In the next part of the series, we'll sequence the arches to some music and X lights. Download the configuration to the Falcon Pie player and watch the light show. I've seen these box builds done with other types of boxes, such as the CG1500 or 2000, or even so, some ammo crate boxes. If you have any suggestions on how to build your box or any tips and tricks while building a box, please list them in the comments below. If you like this video, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to be notified of any future episodes. Once again, I'm Robert Donlan, and this is Lights by the Sea. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. So let's get started.